so grateful for Ben and Savannah and their family and for bringing them here around Rock God. Uh, there's a whole host of humanity that does not know you here. And Lord, new things grow. And so I'm excited to partner uh, with Ben in even a small way. So Lord, I lift them to you now. Open, open, open your word, Lord. Speak to us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. But do you love Jesus this morning? Y'all doing well? Awesome. Well, if you got your Bible, let's go to Exodus chapter 2. And if you're new, um, that's like the second book, so it's toward the beginning. And um, Exodus, just to give some background, is written uh, by Moses. So Moses actually writes uh, this book. So we're going to be camped out in Exodus chapter number 4. And uh, the title of my message this morning is this. Uh, It's never too late to be who you might have been. Is it going off? Test one, two. It's you, man. Okay. All right. I'll just hold it closer. Uh, Yeah. Exodus 4. It's never too late to be who you might have been. We're going to take a look at uh, verses 1 through 5. It says this. But Moses protested again. What if they won't believe me or listen to me? What if they say, the Lord never appeared to you? Then the Lord asked him, what is that in your hand? And he says, a shepherd's staff. Throw it on the ground, the Lord said. So Moses threw down the staff and it turned into a snake. And Moses jumped back. Then the Lord told him, reach out and grab it by its tail. Turn your neighbor and say, bad decision. Bad decision. Moses reached out, grabbed it, and turned it back into a shepherd's staff in his hand. Perform this sign, the Lord told him. Then they will believe that the Lord... The God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob really has appeared to you. Would you pray with me just one more time? We're going to pray over God's word and pray that he would move this morning in our presence. Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for uh, this community of believers. We thank you for the opportunity to get together, to lift you up. God, more than anything else here today, we pray that we would see what you have for our life, see how you want to work through us. And so, Father, I pray today that we would, God, just be in step with your spirit. It's in your powerful, holy name that we pray. Amen. Switching out the mic. All right. (laughs) Well, hey, I want to ask you guys a question this morning. um, And uh, it's this question. If you were going to summarize your life in six words, what would you say? If you're going to summarize your entire life, your existence into six words... What would you say? A, um, an online magazine did this very thing just a few years back, and they gave this challenge to people, and they said, summarize your life in six words. This actually came from uh, the, the uh, poet Ernest Hemingway and the writer H- Ernest Hemingway, where he wrote about his life in six words. And this is what Ernest Hemingway said. He came from a really abusive childhood, was in war, like had a really rough background. And this is what Ernest Hemingway said in uh, describing his, his background. He said, This in six words, for sale, baby shoes, never worn. For sale, baby shoes, never worn. He describes his life in six words. And so I wonder what you would say about your life this morning in six words, if you had to summarize it. I was... um, I was on the website, and there's some pretty incredible uh, six-word testimonies here. I'd love to read a couple to you. One of them says this, painful nerd kid... Happy nerd adult. I think there's some people like that in the room. 70 years, few tears, hairy ears. Here's a good one. Uh, Psychic told me I'd be richer. (laughs) There's a bunch of really good ones on there. Um, In fact, they wrote a book about it, and the book is actually called Not Quite What I Was Planning. Um, I tell you what, get that. It's uh, hours of enjoyment, and it's really cool because it's only six words, so you're moving from spot to spot. But as I was reading through this, there was one quote that really stood out to me, and it, it made me pause. Like, I, don't, I don't know if you've had those moments in life where you have that thing that just jumps off the page of you and grabs you, but this, this quote right here, this, these six words jumped out at me like nothing else I'd seen before. It, it says this, thought I would have more impact. I wonder, have you ever taken a look at your life and asked that same question? 
what impact do you have on the world? What impact do you have in the lives of the people that you interact with? I think if you're like me, if you're like most people, many times we can look at our lives and say, yeah, I would love to have a legacy. I would love to have impact. But the problem is this, is that I get into the daily grind. Like we're about to have our third kid. It'll be three kids under four years old. So you can pray for me there. But you just get into this grind and you go day to day to day, you're nine to five. And all of a sudden you look up to catch your breath and, you know, 10 years has gone by. You're like, what happened with my life? And so I saw this and I started to think to myself, I was like, man, what, what impact does my life have on the world around me? I think many times we have this idea that uh, if you want to have true impact, that's really only for a, a select few. That's for like gifted people or, or, or blessed people. That's, that's for those special people who've got it all figured out. But I want you to know here this morning is that God has a plan and a purpose for each and every one of our lives. He has a plan and a purpose for more than just your mundane, more than just your nine to five. God has a plan and a purpose for you to make an eternal impact. And here's the kicker, that he has a plan for you and you could change the world if you pressed into it. Do you believe that this morning? That you could actually change the world if you pressed into all that God had for you? I believe that God has placed eternity in each and every one of our hearts and because he's placed eternity there, we have, a, we have a plan and a purpose that God's given us. And so the trick is figuring out what is your purpose. Like this isn't, you may be here today and, and, and you may not even be all about this church thing. Like this isn't even a church thing. It isn't a Christian thing. Like this is just a thing thing, right? This is just like a people thing. Everybody has this inside of them, a desire to make a lasting impact, to see ourself go beyond Ourself. Moses is in this exact same spot. Uh, if you remember the life of Moses back in Exodus chapter 2, Moses is a baby boy. And it just so happens that Moses finds himself in the palace of Pharaoh. At that point in time, Pharaoh uh, had the nation of Israel underneath him and they were slaves building up his kingdom and building up his empire. And so what happened in this moment was Pharaoh said, all right, they're growing so large. They're getting, they could be so powerful. We need to stop them. And so he put out a decree to, to kill all the baby boys. Well, Moses's mom said, well, that's not going to happen to little Moses, right? And so she gets a, a basket of papyrus and she puts Moses in there and she sends him down the river, sends him down the river to who knows where. Guess where Moses ends up? In the palace of Pharaoh coincidence and yet here he is his blood is the nation of Israel and here here he is in the palace of the king Moses an Israelite boy in the palace and so Moses finds himself here in between two worlds an Israelite in an Egyptian palace do you see the conflict that's there you see, we see the life of Moses, especially early on when he's, he's delivering the nation of Israel. And we know that God's got a calling on his life to deliver God's people. But did you know that God had actually placed that in his heart much sooner than that? He placed it in his heart while he was still living in the palace. We know this because it says, and check this out, Exodus 2, turn there with me, just a page over. Look what it says here in verse number 11. It says, many years later... When Moses had grown up, he went out to visit his own people. Remember, Moses is writing this book. Moses, at that point in time, God has been working and cultivating in his heart to move from his identity being that of an Egyptian to having a heart for his people. God has placed a calling on his life that is beginning to come to the surface. It's kind of like labor pains, right? It's, it's hard. It's building up to this moment. And Moses is feeling this as he's here and he's wrestling with his identity. What will I do? Will I continue to live in a life of luxury in the palace? Will I continue to live a safe life, a comfortable life? Or will this thing that's being birthed inside of me come out? And what Moses does is this. Look at verses 12 through 14 with me. He says this. After looking in, so, so he goes out. He says he sees an Egyptian beating one of the Hebrews. And then in verse 12, it says, after looking in all directions to make sure no one was watching, Moses kills 
the Egyptian. He kills the Egyptian. He makes a foolish decision in the moment. Was the, the desi- was the desire that God had for his life wrong? No. But the way in which he did it, it was foolish. See, Moses is here in this moment, and he goes and he kills this Egyptian. And then look what happens. It says, the next day when Moses went out to visit his people again, he saw two Hebrew men fighting. Why are you beating up your friend, Moses said to the one who had started the fight? The man replied, who appointed you to be our prince and judge? Are you going to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? Moses is shocked. Moses tries to do the right thing, but he does it the wrong way. Have you ever been there? You've tried to do the right thing, but you just did it the wrong way? Like, what you were going to say was probably right. Like, I get, in, I get myself into trouble with my wife all the time. I try and say the right thing, but I just do it the wrong way, and then I get in trouble, and then i got to apologize. Like, this happened. Okay, I'll just be by myself up here. i got to do this all the time. And so I can do the right thing the wrong way. Moses is in the same situation. He's, he tries to do the right thing, but he does it the wrong way. And so what happens is this, is that Pharaoh then finds out. Now, commentators... And scholars say the same thing. They said that a member of the royal court, if they were to go out and they were to kill someone, that it actually would not be an executable sentence. That it was almost like a slap on the wrist. Like, these are just the common people. Uh, The people that are in the royal court, right, like, you don't want to abuse your power, but this would not have been that big of a deal. Had Moses gone back and said, hey, Pharaoh, look, I'm sorry, here's what happened, I killed this guy, Uh, and he would have had a slap on the wrist, The reason this is so powerful is because of this in verse 15. Look what it says. And sure enough, Pharaoh heard what had happened, and he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in the land of Midian. Moses arrived in Midian and sat down beside the well. What what this is saying is this. You have chosen to identify as an Israelite. Moses, in this moment, steps into his calling, but he does it in the wrong way. And what happens in this moment is this, is that Pharaoh recognizes that he's gone. He now views himself as an Israelite. Moses understands this, and he runs. You see, what Moses was actually trying to do here was this. It wasn't just this rash decision. Moses was trying to start an uprising. Both scholars and historians agree that God had placed this on his heart and Moses stepped out in the wrong way trying to raise up an uprising. And what ends up happening is this, is that he ends up running and it ends up totally failing. Moses thinks that a revolt is going to happen and that the nation of Israel is going to rise up. He keeps keeps seeing their pain and suffering. And what happens from the rash decision is that Moses finds himself in the wilderness for 40 years. Imagine having a mistake, and paying for it for 40 years. Here's Moses doing what he thinks God's calling him to do, and now he's on the run. He does the right thing the wrong way, and now he's on the run. I wonder, how many God-given dreams have died because of past decisions in this room? How many of us who we've tried to do the right thing, or maybe we've got a passion, a desire on our heart, and, we, and something happened. And we feel like our future is gone. Maybe it was, it was just that one night. Or it was just that, that one decision. It was just that one relationship. If it weren't for that, then God could actually use me. But what ends up happening is this, is that Satan gets his claws into us after we make these decisions. And then what we do is we feel unworthy. You see, Moses was in this spot. God didn't tell him to kill the guy. But he put a desire in his heart. To, to really stir, stir up the nation of Israel and to lead them. Moses was trying to live that out. He just did it the wrong way. Many of us have that same type of story. We've got a past. You may be in here today and you come in with some baggage in your life. Can I tell you, you're not alone? That the person standing up here talking to you has the same thing. And God, when we press into him, will use us in ways that we can't even imagine. Here's Moses trying to do the right thing the wrong way. He allows, and this is the interesting thing, is that the failures of your past have now defined his future. 
I wonder if you've allowed your past to define your future, that impact that you want to make on the world. I wonder if you've allowed that to define your future. Maybe that one decision, maybe that one bankruptcy, maybe that is the thing that's going to define your future and how God can use you. Can I tell you here today that God is a God of grace and that God will extend that grace to you? He doesn't expect you to stay in that. Look what happens here. Moses, he, he's here, and he's wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. I mean, this is nuts. But look what it says, chapter 3, verse number 1. It says this. One day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro. Now, i got to stop right there. Moses, after 40 years of being in the wilderness, 40 years of working, you know what he's graduated to? Substitute shepherd. That's how far Moses has gotten. Like, that, that's it. Like, he doesn't even own the sheep that he's shepherding. It's his father-in-law's. Every single day, do you think he wakes up and, and he thinks, I used to live in the palace of the most powerful man in the world. Do you see the regret? Do you see the anger? A dream deferred. Here's Moses, and every single day that he's walking around with a shepherd's cane, He remembers his past failure. Look what it says. It says, here he is, tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. And then look what happens here. It says in verse 2, there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of the bush. Moses stared in amazement, though the bush was engulfed in flames, It didn't burn up. I wonder how many of you here today feel the same way as Moses. Like the best years of your life are gone. Like you're you're too unworthy for God to use you. Like you're you're too unqualified for God to use your life. Maybe you feel like the supporting actor in your own story. Moses is in the exact same predicament having spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness. And this is what happens. He has this this encounter with the living God. I think there's somebody here this morning that you're allowing your past to define your future. That the purpose that God has for your life hasn't been fulfilled. And that God is actually calling you to more. I wonder if today is the day that God, this is your burning bush moment, that God won't meet you in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of your failure, in the middle of your predicament, and say, I'm not done with you yet. I think my mission today is to tell somebody that God's not done with you, that he's not done with your life. He's not done with your circumstance. He's not done with you because if you've got breath in your your lungs, if you've got a beat in your heart, God has a plan and a purpose for your life. He has a purpose for your life because he says, I've placed you exactly where I've placed you. We were talking about this just earlier. That in Acts, it says that God has placed you in specific times and locations for a specific purpose. God wants to use you in a powerful way. And yet, how many times do we get in our own way? We say, God, I'm unworthy. I'm not qualified. I'm not not ready to move into this. And yet, here's God, and he shows up in the middle of nowhere with Moses And he says, you can't mess up your life to the point that I can't use you. Moses has an encounter with God. And in an instant, everything changes. When I was 25 years old, I walked into a church, and you guys heard this story. And I met God for the very first time. I met him in a real way, and it radically changed my life. You can come talk to my wife after this service. She'll tell you, I'm a completely different person. The joy, the fulfillment that God has placed in my life. And here's the crazy thing, that when I got saved, God actually called me out of the military. I had no idea where I was going. I went from a commander of 130 soldiers, having a, 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 being a distinguished war veteran, having a position, having prestige. And I went, and you know what God placed me in? As a part-time shoe salesman in my hometown. 
Imagine people that you've known for a long time that when, when you're the valedictorian, when you're the all-state baseball player, when you're, when you're the one that's supposed to achieve, here you are working as a part-time shoe salesman. Come, somebody walks into the room and asks, Ben, what, what are you doing here? You feel that? And God, in that moment, he said, I'm going to use you, Ben, but it's not the way that you think. He places me in this situation and he leaves me there for half of a year. He says, I want you. What you need to do, Ben, is just like Moses, as Moses exodus is out of Egypt, God takes another 40 years to get the Egypt out of Moses. It took me that period of time to get the pride out of me, to humble myself, to say, you know what? I am no longer defined by my position I'm no, longer, I'm no longer defined by my performance. I'm defined by the fact that all I am is a child of God. That's who I am. That's my identity. And it took that period of time to change that within me. I'm telling you, maybe you're here today and your situation is a setup. That the reason that you're going through a tough time, a difficult time, the reason that you can't seem to find purpose in life, the reason that things are just difficult is that God is setting you, setting you up for something much greater. That he's setting you up to be all that he's placed in your heart. That the passion and purpose that he's placed in you will actually be fulfilled because of the pain that you went through. Your past does not define your future. God does. Your past is just a setup for all that God wants to do in your life. And Moses is here in this moment and he feels the same thing. God will wreck your plans. And will give you a new purpose. I make far less money, work way more hours, and yet I am more blessed because in my heart I am doing the purpose that God has built me to do. I wonder if you found that here today. Because when I ask that question about impact, when I ask that question about what, if, if it were all to be taken away, what would you want your life to say? What would you want your obituary to be? That's where your purpose is. God has given each and every one of us that. And many times what we have to do is get out of the way and press into God. Moses is in this moment confronted with the living God. I begin to think about this in my own life and think about uh, just the fact that here it is, God wants to give me this plan and a purpose, but what often happens for me is that I actually suppress that desire. I suppress it inside of me. And this is what I suppress it for. I wrote some of these down. I I suppress it because I really, I want to be liked. I want to get a good job. I want, I wanted to find a wife. I want to have a house with a white picket fence. I wanted to have a car that the neighbors envied at. I wanted to have a long weekends and, and, and good vacations. I wanted to have a fun retirement. I wanted to grow old and healthy. I wanted to die easy. And I, I didn't want to go to hell. And other than that, that was the dream of my life. And saying that here this morning, do you feel how shallow that actually is? Yet how many of us, we live our lives day after day after day with no idea and no no thought as to the vision that God wants to use us for. The fact that you and I, we are placed, we're exiles in this land. We're, We're placed here in Round Rock, Texas to make a difference for those that don't know Jesus. God has placed us in our neighborhood. I had the opportunity to lead one of my neighbors to the Lord just a couple months ago. His life has radically changed, not because I did anything crazy, but because I met him where he was at. God placed me there for a purpose. Our next door neighbors told me, they said, we don't know if we'll ever come to your church, but we know that God placed you here for us. God has positioned each and every one of us in this same spot. And Moses had to get over his own insecurity. Many of us have to get over our own insecurity. Many of us have to get over our own past and believe that God has a plan for our future. I want to ask you a question. I wonder, have have you put to bed something that God wants to wake up? Has there been a past dream, a plan that God's placed on your heart that you've, you've just pushed down? Or maybe you tried it and you failed. I really do think that there's a businessman out here today that God is calling you to something more. God's calling you to start your own business. He's calling you to a brand new adventure. 
Maybe there's a mom here today, and God is calling you to stay, take a step of faith for your family, to get involved in a community group, to get involved with people, to start living your life on purpose. Maybe God's calling you not just not to go around the world, but to go across the street and talk to a neighbor. Maybe God is calling you to something new in your work and in your job and in your career. And what we have a tendency to do is that we get defined by our past failures. And we say, oh God, but, it, but if it weren't for this, look what Moses says here in chapter number four. He says this, he, he says, but Moses protested again and said, what if they won't believe me? How many of you know that there's been so many dreams that have died under the weight of what if? What if? Man, my life, my, God could use me if, if my life hadn't gone through that divorce. You know, God could use me if my life hadn't gone through that bankruptcy. God could really use me then. But now that I've gone through these bad things, now there's no way that God could ever use me again. I just deal with depression, God. Like, there's no way that you can use me in my life. And God is sitting here saying the same thing that he says to Moses. Look what he says. He says this, what is in your hand? Would you do me a favor this morning and put your hand out like this? I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, what's in your hand? What's in your hand? Turn to your other neighbor, your second choice. Tell him sorry. (laughs) Say, what's in your hand? What's in your hand? God, you can put him down. God will use what you already have. God will use your past circumstances to define your future. He uses Moses and a shepherd's staff. I want you to think about this. Every single time Moses looked at a shepherd's staff, what do you think came to his mind? Not good enough. Failure. Wilderness. 40 years, right? God, 40 years. Substitute shepherd. That's Moses. And God Ask Moses the same thing he asks you. He says, what is in your hand? What's the thing that you're allowing to define you and God is going to radically change in your life to complete the purpose that he has for you? This is what God wants to do. He's asked you the question, what's in your hand? And Moses, just like you and I, he gets scared, doesn't he? Look what he does. He gets scared. Verse number two, or sorry, verse number three. God says, throw it down on the ground. So Moses threw it down on the ground and it turned into a snake. And then it says, Moses jumps back. That's probably a good reaction, right? Turns into a snake, he jumps back. Moses throws it on the ground and it turns into his worst nightmare. I made the decision to follow Jesus. I get out of the military. I'm making great money, driving a Hummer, have a beautiful house. And all of a sudden, I'm working as a part-time shoe salesman. I'm telling you, I was frustrated. I was scared. And what God told me in that moment was, Ben, throw it down. Put it down. Put your career down. Put your view of yourself down, Ben. Put it down on the ground. And why don't you define yourself by what I call you? Put it down. But how many of us, what we do is we we do this. the tail, right? Anybody handle snakes? <laughs> That's not the best spot to handle it. <laughs> he picks it up by the tail and look what happens. It says it immediately turns back into a shepherd's staff. I want you to think about this. God is telling you, God is telling me, he says, I want you to put that down, lay it down before my feet. Give me that thing. And you know what the thing is. Give me that thing that's been defining you. He says, lay it down at my feet. And then what I want you to do is handle it. I want you to pick it up. I want you to press into it in my name. I want you to lay it at my feet and it will change your life. Lay it down. Do you remember what God does with this shepherd's staff? The thing that defined Moses? The thing that defined who he was? The guilt and the shame that he had? That same staff 
was the staff that delivered the nation of Israel across the Red Sea. It was the same staff that hit a rock and allowed a river of water in the desert. It was the same staff that turned a body of water into blood and then back into a body of water. It was the same staff that delivered a people. God will use your pain to give you your purpose. He will take the thing that you don't want to pick up, that you don't want to go back to, and he will use it to change your life and the lives of those around you. I wonder how many today we're left looking at it. We've laid it down, but we've just prayed over it. I'm just praying over it, God. I'm just looking at it. I'm just worried about it. And God is telling you the same thing he's telling Moses. Pick it up. Pick it up in my name. Press into me because when we do, he will use your life for a purpose. He will use your life to make a difference. He will use your life to change this city. God has positioned you here for this time and this moment. You're never too late to be who you might have been. Let's pray.